Welcome everybody and thank you for staying until the last presentation and thank you Mr. Fredrickson for introduction. Uh, my talk will be today about robustness of the CAN-FD bus system. Uh, classical CAN has a big success story, had a big success story and still have it and one main reason for the success of classical CAN is its robustness. It just works everywhere. And first, I'd like to motivate why we do have to think about robustness when we consider CAN-FD. Why is it not implicit, the robustness? And everybody knows that the CAN physical layer is really simple. And due to this simplicity, uh, uh, the bit durations, I'm sorry, the bit durations vary in reality, so they are not constant. And to show this variation, I borrowed a picture from Mark Schreiner from Daimler. He did some measurements at two megabits at some setup. And we can see here that a 500 nanoseconds uh, dominant bit that was transmitted may grow to 620 nanoseconds in his setup. And so dominant bits grow and recessive bits shrink. So a 500 nanosecond uh, recessive bit shrank to less than 400 nanoseconds. In percent, these are shrinking, uh, the shrinks and grows more than 20%. So we have extreme variations. We could even talk about variable bit rate can. Um, and so the question is now, how can I check if my bus communication is robust? I have immense shrinkings and, and growing. By, how, how, can I, how can I decide if something is, is this, if my bus system is robust or not? Uh, Mr. Hell from Infineon uh, already talked today about uh, shrinking and growing of bits. He called it bit asymmetry, and he also mentioned the reasons for these effects. And so uh, I come to the agenda. Uh, oh yes, and I want, in, I'm sorry, in this presentation I will provide methods that help us to answer this question, is my bus system robust or not? So this is the target of the presentation. And now I come to my agenda, and actually I have two parts. The first part, is uh, where I will show you, this is some, some, some background, I show you that uh, how a receiving node recognizes that an edge is shifted. And in the second part, I will talk about, or we will together calculate some properties of the bus system, and the results will help us to decide is it robust or not. So we're coming to the first point. How does a receiving node uh, recognize that an edge is shifted? And the answer is it measures, so he recognizes a phase error. But what is a phase error? So it is defined in the following way. For each node, the distance in time between the detected position and the expected position of an edge is called the phase error of that edge. And here is an example that visualizes it. So on the top, I have the detected signal at the node. And on the bottom, I have the expected signal by that node. And so we see at the edge A, I have uh, a big phase error, this uh, green shaded area, and at edge B, I have a small phase error. So it's actually the difference between expected and detected. And this phase error is a sum of several errors. So many errors <laughs> contribute to this phase error. And uh, yes, and when we have a look at these errors that contribute to the phase error, then we see that they can be classified into two classes. The one class are the accumulating errors, and the other, the non-accumulating ones. So what are these, the accumulating errors? The different actual bit rates in sender and receiver lead to a phase error that adds up over time, so it accumulates. And the most prominent example for this, uh, for an accumulating error, is the frequency error that is caused by the frequency tolerance of the used oscillator. So I use an oscillator with 40 megahertz, but it won't have 40 megahertz. It, won't have, it, will, it will have 39 point something or 40 point something. So it will have a, some, a small deviation. The second class of errors are the non-accumulating errors. Uh, and these errors, the non-accumulating errors, cause temporary shifts of edges or temporary shifts of the view of the node who is watching to this edge, who is looking at this edge. And these errors do not accumulate over time. And the most prominent example for such an error is the bit symmetry error. This means I have an 
asymmetric, I have asymmetric bits. So the dominants are, tend to be longer and the recessive bits tend to get shorter. And this uh, shrinking and growing of bits is usually caused by transceivers, by the bus topology, but electromagnetic disturbances and by many things. And since we can't uh, erase these errors, they are there, we have to live with them. And now we need some methods to handle them. And to handle the accumulating errors, uh, we will calculate the allowed oscillator tolerance frequency. And now you ask, okay, there are several errors. Why to calculate just the oscillator tolerance frequency? And the reason is, even if there are several errors in this error class, they can all be transformed into, an os into a frequency tolerance. So I can transform every error in this class to a frequency tolerance. And to account for the second class of errors, we will calculate the phase margin. And the phase margin is a measure for the allowed shift of an edge. And so the rest of the presentation has again two parts. The one part will handle the oscillator tolerance uh, calculation and the other one, the phase margin calculation. So we come to the oscillator tolerance, to the allowed oscillator tolerance that is allowed in a KNFD bus system. So first, let's have a look at a phase error that is caused by such an uh, oscillator frequency tolerance. So a real oscillator has an actual frequency that is within a tolerance range, dF, around its nominal frequency. So my F oscillator is in the range of F nominal times one minus dF up to F nominal times one plus dF. And the consequence of this tolerance is that my individual CAN nodes run at different uh, bit rates. And different bit rates mean the bit durations slightly differ and this causes a phase error. And this phase error adds up, adds up with every bit received. And here you see an example that visualizes this. On the top, we have the view of the receive, uh, we have the view of the transmitting node. And on the bottom, we have the view of the receiving node. And we see that the transmitting node has slightly longer bit times, slightly longer. And because of these longer bit times, the receiving node recognizes at every bit edge uh, a phase error. And here the phase error is small, here it grows, and at bit three it's three times the size. So the phase error grows. And now we are interested in the maximum frequency tolerance that is allowed in KNFD. And to answer this question we need some background and only a few points. And we need to know that CAN nodes resynchronize to eliminate this phase error. And we also need to know that with each resynchronization, the CAN node has to be able to eliminate the complete phase error that was caused by the oscillator frequency tolerance. Otherwise, it would still accumulate and the system wouldn't be robust. Further, there exist worst case bit sequences where the time between two resynchronizations is maximum. And we have to consider these worst case bit sequences. And the last thing we have to know is that uh, can, a CANFD frame has the two phases, the arbitration phase and the data phase. What this means, everybody I think knows. So we, we're coming to the calculation. So during calcul uh, for the calculation, we have to derive for each worst case bit sequence a condition for DF, for this oscillator tolerance. And classical CAN already provides these conditions. They're in the ISO standard. And they cover the arbitration phase. So this is fine. But we have now, additionally, this data phase with another bitrate. We have a bitrate switch. And to cover this data phase and the bitrate switching, we need some new conditions. And I want now to derive exemplary a condition that you see how this works. We consider the following case where we switch the bitrate from low to high. And the corresponding worst case bit sequence looks the following. You don't have to understand this. Uh, you just have to see. So if, 
Uh, if you study KNFT for a while, that this is totally clear to you, so it's no magic at all. But you just have to understand we have here the arbitration phase on the left and the data phase on the right, and somewhere in the middle we switch to bitrate. And we have here synchronization in the arbitration phase, then some time passes, and again in the data phase we will resynchronize again. And from this picture, we can derive the resulting condition. And the condition looks in the following way. It says df is smaller than some ratio. And how do I get this ratio? And this ratio has in the numerator, so above the line, the maximum correctable phase shift. So actually, how much can I correct at this point here? And the denominator says, how long is the time between the two synchronizations? And therefore, I have to look for the worst case for the longest time between two synchronizations. <coughs> and now you think, OK, that looks quite complicated. Where do I get the parameters from? Everybody has the parameters who operates a kind of bus because these are the parameters from the bit timing configuration. So you have them if you oper operate a kind of bus. In total, we found five of these conditions. They are listed in this table. Uh, the two conditions for the arbitration phase are already in the ISO standard. And these three new conditions are only needed when we use, in the data phase, a different bitrate. So if I use just the feature of KNFD with a longer payload, then we just need these two conditions. And if I use the bitrate switching, we additionally need these three conditions. So now we are interested in how do these three conditions affect the oscillator, the allowed oscillator tolerance in KNFT? Does it get worse? Does it get better? What happens? And therefore, I did some evaluation, and I will show here some exemplary results. So we know we have these formulas, and we have to put there the parameters from the, conf from the bit timing configuration. So we need some bit timing configurations, and I assumed some. And I took an arbitration phase bitrate of 500 kilobits uh, and data phase bitrates in the range of 1 to 10 megabits. Because this is quite a common, so the arbitration phase bitrate is quite common, therefore this example. And on the right side, we see the results. So we see on the vertical axis the oscillator tolerance, this DF, and on the horizontal axis the bitrate in the data phase. And we see five curves because we have five conditions and we just calculate the, outcome, uh, the result of the equation and plot it here. What we can see that condition one and two are these two horizontal lines, and this is clear because we kept the arbitration phase bitrate for all calculations constant, and so we have the horizontal lines here. And the other three lines go up and down because, yes, we, we changed the bit timing parameters. And a KNFD node or KNFD bus system has to satisfy, so the, the oscillators that are used in a KNFD bus system have to satisfy all of these uh, conditions. So the resulting oscillator tolerance range is above all of these curves marked here with an orange uh, area. Uh, and now we can make the following observations. Uh, condition five is the most critical when the data phase bitrate is getting quite high. So we see this red blue curve, uh, this uh, light blue curve is dropping, dropping, dropping when we increase the, uh, the bitrate in the data phase. F further, we can see that the classical CAN conditions one and two, so these two horizontal lines, limit the allowed DF, oscillator tolerance, as long as, so we see it's limiting, it's limiting, it's, lim it's limiting, as long as the ratio of data to arbitration phase bitrate is relatively small. In this example, uh, this ratio is nine. So at this point, we have 4.4 megabits in the data phase, 0.5 in the arbitration phase. So the ratio is nine. And up to this point, the old rules are limiting. And just here, the new rules start limiting. So what is the consequence? If the ratio is small, then, uh, then the oscillator tolerance of KNFD is equal to that of classical CAN. So it's not worse. So we stay same. 
And since the usual uh, bitrate combinations will be, let's say, 500 kilobit and 2 megabit in the data phase, or let's say even 4 megabit, we, the, the oscillator tolerance won't be version, so it will stay the same as in classical CAN. And we, make this, we made this observation not just for this example. I also tried a lot of other arbitration phase bitrates, and it was always the same outcome. So sometimes this ratio was 9 or 7 or 6 or 10, but it was always a small number. OK, so so far to the oscillator tolerance that is allowed in KNFD. Um, now we will go on to the phase margin. In case of the phase margin, uh, we want to know what is, uh, okay, sorry. So what we want to know now is if a bit is sampled correctly despite the presence of these non-accumulating errors. So now we care about the other type of errors. So now we don't care if we can correct this error or not, or this, this phase shift or not. We care about can we sample the bit or can't we? And the question we have to ask now is, how large is the maximum acceptable edge shift that is caused by non-accumulating errors at a given tolerance of the oscillator frequency? So we don't forget about the other errors, uh, and we are still interested in the edge shift that is allowed. And to answer this question, uh, we introduced two new metrics, and we call them phase margin. And this phase margin quantifies this allowed phase, uh, this allows quantifies the allowed phase shift or the edge shift. And phase margin one quantifies the phase shift at the beginning of the bit and phase margin two at the end of the bit. And here we see a small example. We have an Rx signal and phase margin one is this red light area and phase margin two this yellow area. So if the edge of the received bit is inside this area, I still sample the bit correctly and the same holds for the phase margin too. And if I want to calculate this phase margin, I again need some worst case bit sequences. And they exist for both, for phase margin one and phase margin two, and there are different worst case bit sequences. And I want now to evaluate again the phase margin one, and because we the time is limited, I, I will stay with phase margin one and you can read all about phase margin two in the, present, in the paper. So we consider again a case, and we consider the case where the bit asymmetry that is caused by the transceiver is maximum. And the corresponding case is where we have five dominant bits followed by one recessive bit. And this figure here below shows uh, this scenario. So we have on the top the signal that is arriving at the R Rx node. And on the bottom, we see the view of the Rx node. And you see something is different now. We see some uh, shaded areas. And these are the segments. So the, the receiving node sees the world in segments because the bit time in CAN is built up from segments. The details are not important. Important is that there is some sample point. And the phase margin is now the distance between the sample point of this bit 6 and the beginning of bit 6. So this is the phase margin. And this edge may be here in the middle or even here at the edge, and I will still sample it because my sample point inside the node is at this point. Okay. But now we want to know, OK, how does this behave? When I change the bit rate, what happens with the phase margin? And, and how big is the phase margin? Uh, yes, and therefore, we do the same evaluation as before. We take our bit timing configurations from before and calculate this phase margin and plot it. And there's one remark to the bit timing configurations. We are now just in the data phase, so we don't need an arbitration phase bit rate currently. So, the results, we see on the vertical axis the phase margin one in nanoseconds, and on the horizontal, again, the bit rate in the data phase, and we see a whole set of curves. And I plotted a set of curves because we 
still in the phase margin, when you calculate the phase margin, we still consider the oscillator tolerance that is in the system. So uh, when I, I set up a Kennedy bus system, then I use some oscillators, I know their tolerance, and this is this tolerance, so the DF used, the actual that is in the, in the nodes. And we have DF used 0%, so this is the, the maximum you can achieve. And then some typical values up to 0.5. And additionally, on the right, you also can see the sample point uh, in the data phase, because this has some impact on the phase margin. What are the main observations we can make here? We can see that the phase margin decreases towards higher bit rates. And uh, this is clear, because the phase margin is a part of the bit, and the bit time also decreases with the bit rate. So at one megabit, I have 1,000 nanoseconds. At two megabits, I have 500 nanoseconds bit time. When we look at the phase margin, at one megabit, I have 500, so roughly half of the bit. And at two megabit, I have roughly 250 nanoseconds. So with the bit time, the phase margin decreases. The second observation is that the impact of the frequency tolerance on the phase margin is quite small. So the five or six curves I plotted here they are nearly one on, so we even can distinguish them. And the reason for that is that the bit sequence we consider now is quite short compared to the bit sequence we considered when we calculated the oscillator tolerance. So we consider a quite short bit sequence. And the last observation is that a later sample point increases the phase margin one. And we can see this here. I said the phase margin decreases towards higher bit, rate, bit rates, but somehow here at four, four and a half, and five megabits, the phase margin is constant. That's strange. But when we have a look at the sample point, we see the sample point is shifted to the, towards the end of the bit, and this compensates actually the decrease. So this is the reason why this is not smooth, because uh, the sample point is shifted here. And why did I shift the sample point? Because the bits in a CAN node, so I took realistic uh, bit timing configurations, doesn't allow any resolution, so the, the, the registers are limited in resolution, so uh, I couldn't configure something else because I assumed for this bit timing settings 40 megahertz, and then when you go to, let's say, five megabit, uh, then you have only eight time quanta left, so you can't put the uh, sample point at any place. Okay, so, we want to have now a look at one specific data phase bitrate to understand the outcome a little bit better. So we have a detailed look at two megabits and a real oscillator tolerance of 0.5%. So we see the same picture as before, but now with numbers. So again on the top, the signal that I receive, and on the bottom, how my receiving node sees the world. What do we see? First, at two megabits, we have a nominal bit time of 500 nanoseconds. These are the 500 nanoseconds. And since we have a tolerance in the oscillator frequency, the receiving, so the received bits are slightly longer. They are 502.5 nanoseconds. And the bits expected by the receiving node are slightly shorter. So they are 497.5 nanoseconds. So in total, we have five nanoseconds difference between expected and detected bits. Um, yes, when we look at, at this point where the phase margin is, then we see there are other errors too. They are described in the paper, but I will shortly mention them here. So we have a quantization error of 50 nanoseconds. That sounds really a lot. And the point is, my colleague Florian Hartwig mentioned that the protocol state machine is executed just once per time quanta. And in this case, we have a time quanta length of 50 nanoseconds. So we have a quantization error in worst case of 50 nanoseconds. Because we sample the incoming uh, signal just once every 50 nanoseconds, and then we make an error. Uh, and then we have a phase error of 26 nanoseconds. But how do we get 26 nanoseconds? So we have here five nanoseconds difference between detected and expected bit length. And we consider five bits. So five times five, five times five is 25. But the values here are 
not that accurate, so it's 0.5 something. So when you calculate accurately, we get 26 nanoseconds. And the rest, what is remaining, the phase margin, is 224 nanoseconds. Where do I get this value from? On the previous slide, we had this curve, this diagram, and we just check at 2 megabit per second, we get a 224 nanoseconds from the calculation. So I can use this phase margin uh, to be more robust. And um, so this edge at the beginning of bit six may shift somewhere, maybe somewhere in this light red area, and I still sample the bit correctly. And there, this red curve marks now the latest allowed edge position to sample the bit correctly. And the sample point is here, so I will sample the bit correctly. Okay, so this phase margin one allows to tolerate an edge shift of, let's say, 100, uh, where, let's say, the, the, nan the transceiver uh, has a part of 100 nanoseconds, so the transceiver shifts this edge by 100 nanoseconds, and the bus topology shifts it by further 124 nanoseconds. So this was my last content slide, and I come now to the summary and to the conclusions. So we saw we have two classes of errors. And these are the accumulating errors and the non-accumulating errors. And to account for the accumulating errors, we have to calculate the allowed DF, the allowed tolerance of the oscillator in CAN, FD. And when we know this value, we can use oscillators with a lower tolerance, and then we are safe. And for the non-accumulating errors, we have to calculate the phase margin. And the phase margin is a measure for the allowed shift of the edges. And now both oscillator, toler oscillator frequency tolerance and this phase margin both depend on the bit timing configurations I use. So everybody has to calculate this for his bit timing configurations. You can't just check my curves. They won't be correct for you. So everybody has to calculate this. And both oscillator tolerance and phase margin based on different worst case bit sequences. And now comes my conclusion. If you want to design a robust KNFD bus system, you should perform the theoretical evaluations with your bit timing configurations. You should perform physical layer simulations to quantify the edge shifts in your setup, in your bus topology, because everybody uses different transceivers, they behave differently, different topologies. These all impact highly on the edge shifts. And then, uh, in the simulations, you should also consider the corner cases, because uh, you, you should, so you should use the minus 40 degree and 150 degree, and uh, should, you should check the data sheet and, and, and configure your transceivers, to be, your transceivers to behave like the corner cases from the data sheet. And finally, you should set up the bus in the lab and make a plausibility check if your calculations and your simulations are right, if they fit to each other. So now I reach the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. And yeah, I'm open for questions.